Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. And I want to report on the infected blood scandal that's just been published in a report in my country. Now, I remember people talking about this and this going on early on in my career because this happened in the in the 70s and the 80s. So it appears that in my country, the delay from something going wrong to the final report on it seems to be about 40 years. So if it was anything is going wrong in healthcare at the moment, hypothetically speaking, but it's possible there's things going wrong, then I guess we'll know about it fairly fully in roughly, well, what is it now, 2024 now, so probably about 2064 we'll know about it. Now, in 2064, I will not be here. Most of the people that are potentially doing things, oh, I don't know, doing things, who knows, maybe even doing things wrong, now and in the past few years won't be here either. This 40-year delay is not acceptable. Anyway, here's the report. Um, in, in, infected blood scandal. It runs to about 2,500 pages, and you can download it all there. I haven't read through it all by any means. <laughs> it's quite a long document, but it's all there and uh, readily available if, if you want to look at it. Now, I think I'll start off by something that our Prime Minister said, Rishi Sunak. A day of shame for the British state. Worst treatment scandal in NHS history. Today's report shows a decades-long moral failure at the heart of our national life. From the National Health Service to the Civil Service to ministers in successive governments at every level, the people and institutions in which we have placed our trust failed in the most harrowing and devastating way. They failed the victims and their families, and they failed this country. I wonder what people will be saying in 2065. Moral failure at the heart of our national life, in which doctors, civil servants and ministers have put reputations above patient safety. On behalf of this, of this and every government stretching back to the 1970s, I am truly sorry. That was from the Prime Minister today. The final report concluded, health services and governments took part in a chilling cover-up. It looks from this that cover-ups are possible in my country, in the United Kingdom. A chilling cover-up as they closed ranks to hide the truth, even destroying documents to keep patients in the dark. Incredible. Now, Sir Brian Langstaff is the chair of the inquiry. And do, do look at it. It's all quite readable, this material. It's all in the public domain. Talks about a horrifying scandal that could and should have been avoided. But a catalogue of failures led to calamity. These are really pretty strong words. And it shows that these things are capable of happening in the UK. Calamities can happen even in my country. And you know what? Maybe even in yours, wherever you are, if you're not watching in the UK. Quite possible. It will be astonishing to anyone who reads this report that these events could have happened in the UK. That a level of suffering, which is difficult to comprehend, still less understand, has been caused to so many. Victims of the scandal have been forced into a decades-long battle for truth. Imagine that, a decades-long battle for truth. People weren't truthful straight away. It took decades for the truth to come out. Just unfortunate that it took decades for the truth to come out. Successive governments claimed that patients had received the best medical treatment available. At the time and that blood screening had been introduced at the earliest possible opportunities. Both claims were untrue. Governments making claims about health that weren't true, that are not true. Standing back and viewing the response of the NHS and of governments overall, the answer to the question, was there a cover-up, is that there has been. In other words, there has been a cover-up. Not in the sense of a handful of people plotting in an orchestrated conspiracy to mislead, but in a way that was much more subtle, more pervasive and more chilling in its implications, according to Sir Brian Langstaff. 
in this way there's been a hiding of much of the truth the tragedy was not an accident now i'm hesitant to pick out any individuals here but one former health minister ken clark inquiry concluded he had misled the public in an indefensible way over the risks It said there'd been no conclusive proof of infection via this route. So Brian said that while this was technically correct, its use was indefensible because it did not spell out the real risk. And that makes you wonder, is there things going on today that have a real risk? Who knows? There might be things going on today that have a real risk, but they're simply not being spelt out. Who knows, they might even be being covered up. Anyway, just a few points from the infected blood reports. Uh, This is directly from the report itself. Many of those treated with them, that's the infected blood products, particularly between 1970 and 1998, died or suffered miserably, and many continued to suffer. I have to report, Sir Brian writes, to a catalogue of failures which caused this to happen. Each on its own serious, taken together, they are a calamity. Lord Winston famously called these events the worst treatment disaster in NHS in the history of the NHS. Let's hope there's not a worse one coming up. I have to report that it could be largely, though not entirely, have been avoided. I also have to report that it should have been. I have to report systemic, collective, individual failures to deal ethically, appropriately and quickly with the risk of infection being transmitted in blood. With the infections when the risk materialised and with the consequence for thousands of families. Now after clotting products particularly, now these clotting products, things like factor rate, which is given in haemophilia, we used to call it cryoprecipitate, and I can remember, I don't know if I actually gave it, I was certainly there when it was given there, I remember the infusions going up at the time, a long time ago. Um, but around 1,250 were infected with HIV, the best estimate has included 380 children. Almost all infected with HIV were also infected with hepatitis C and some with hepatitis B and D as well, which are the serum forms of hepatitis. Three quarters of the 1,250 adults and children have died. 2,400 to 5,000 people developed chronic hepatitis C. These are large numbers. Let's hope there's nothing on the horizon with even larger numbers. Who knows, maybe even hundreds of thousands of times more than people more than this. After blood transfusions, between 80 and 100 were infected with HIV. 26,800 were infected with hepatitis C and an increased risk of variant Kreutzfeldt jakob disease, which is a variant disease causing a spongy form encephalopathy. Basically a spongy brain. More than 3,000 deaths attributed to infectious blood, products and tissues. And it was clear beyond doubt from the mid-1940s that blood transfusions or the use of plasma could cause serum hepatitis, which is what they used to call hepatitis, uh, B, C and D before the worked out the virology of that. An awareness of AIDS began in 1981, so it was apparent by mid-1982 that whatever was causing AIDS might be transmissible by blood and blood products. I can remember learning that myself in, must have been 1982 or 1983. Problems identified by the report, failure in the licensing regime. So failing to license products. Deliberate destruction of some documents and the loss of others. Failing to tell people of the risks of treatment and of available to all, and of available alternatives to treatment. So people weren't told about the risks of treatment and they weren't told there was alternatives. Makes you wonder if there's any modern parallels to this, doesn't it? Thus treating them without their informed consent Surely that couldn't happen today, could it? Adopting an attitude of denial towards the risks of treatment. Adopting an attitude of denial towards the risks of treatment. 
Failing to respond to serious risks of infection by making adjustments to treatment regimes to make them safer. So things could have been modified as they went along. Treating children unnecessarily. Treating children unnecessarily. You know, those that don't learn from the mistakes of history are de destined to repeat them. Failing to provide advice, guidance and information to clinicians to ensure that the safe, safer treatment practices were adopted. Adopting the wrong approach by looking for conclusive proof of what the cause was the cause of AIDS rather than asking if there was any real risk that blood might transmit it. Falsely reassuring the public and patients. So it looks like public and patients were falsely reassured. Taking a decision in July 1983 not to suspend continuing importation of commercially produced, commercially produced blood products. Makes you wonder if there's anything today that should be suspended. Having made that decision, failure to keep it under review. There should be ongoing review of what is going on. Conducting research on people without, in many cases, telling them. Research. It's almost as if there was experimental programmes going on and people weren't told about them. Well, there was. We know that's true. Let's hope that's not happening today. In some cases, telling, in some cases, failing to tell people they're infected and thereby denying them the opportunities to control the progression of their illness. Delaying universal screening of blood donations. Delaying universal screening of blood for the presence of hepatitis C. Failing to warn patients of the risks of transfusion, at least in situations where they reasonably had a choice giving too many transfusions that were not clinically needed failure to maximize the use of alternative transfusions failure of record keeping to enable each unit of blood to be traced delayed telling patients they had hepatitis c or should be tested for it being complacent complacency of the risks of non-A, non-B hepatitis, being slow to respond to the risk of AIDS, that non-A, non-B is hepatitis C and D. Being too slow to establish an expert advisory committee on AIDS. Failing to tell people of the risks of treatment of transfusions. Failing to seek their consent on a properly informed basis. Failing to offer people reasonable alternatives to treatments. Alternatives often exist. Delaying informing people of their infections by weeks, months or sometimes years. The absence of any meaningful apology or redress. Repeated use of inaccurate, misleading and defensive lines to take which cruelly told people that they had received the best treatment available. Lines that people learnt, it would appear. A lack of openness, transparency and candour shown by the NHS and government. Such that the truth has been hidden for decades. Failing to provide psychological support and counselling to people who have been infected and their families. Difficulty and delays in access, assessing, accessing appropriate specialist treatment and monitoring. Heck, I mean, we've talked to people just in the past few days who have had difficulty accessing uh, appropriate treatment. Failure of palliative care for those dying in Consequence of infection with HIV or hepatitis. Refusal to provide compensation on the grounds there had been no fault. Long delays in agreeing to provide ex financial support. 
establishing ex gratia payments schemes which were underfunded and did not function in the best interests of those affected. Responding to calls for a public inquiry by producing flawed, incomplete and unfair internal reports. Couldn't happen today, could it? Flawed, incomplete and unfair internal reports. Quite unthinkable, of course. Failing until 2017 to decide to establish a public inquiry. 30, 30, 30 years, at least. Anyway, the chapters that follow, he says, make clear who is responsible for each of these failings, though in general I can say that responsibility for much lies with successive governments. It will be astonishing to anyone who reads this report that these events could have happened in the UK. You know, five years ago I would have agreed with him. Now, I'm not surprised. Not astonished. Times have changed. It may also be surprising that the questions why so many deaths and infections have occurred have not uh, been answered before now. Wrongs were done on individuals, collective and systemic levels. What a level of suffering, which it is difficult to comprehend, still less understand, has been caused to so many, and that this harm has been compounded by the reactions of governments, NHS bodies, other public bodies, medical professionals and others described in the report. A failure to ensure a sufficient supply of uh, factor 8, so supply issues. And it goes on to talk about things like increasing the size of the pools used to manufacture factor 8 concentrates, although it was well known that this would markedly increase the risk of viral transmission. So things that were known to be risky were still done. Failure to encourage and finance research into methods of viral inactivation. Viral inactivation could have prevented many infections, hepatitis and later HIV and deaths. I wonder if there's some way that could reduce the effect of viral infections now that we're not fully utilising. Failing to assure sufficiently careful and rigorous donor selection and screening. So there we are. A few things from the uh, report. Things that went wrong 40 years ago. More than 40 years ago. Now all in the public domain. After a mere 40 years delay. I do hope you are around in 2064. I won't be, but I do hope you are. And then your knowledge will be fuller on what is going on now than it is now. Time to learn from history. Please, thank you for watching.